uh, I want to welcome you to this edition of uh, The View on Africa. Uh, we will be looking at uh, the Boko Haram's uh, release of the 82 uh, Chibok uh, girls. Um, what I really intend to do in this um, uh, briefing is to really just uh, highlight the key intriguing issues uh, in this uh, recent release that we've all been hearing um, on the media and to also help to unpack some of the issues uh, behind um, the release or behind the, the Chibok uh, kidnapping. Um, so if you want to really discuss the issue of uh, kidnapping uh, of the Chibok schoolgirls, I think it will be good to start with the context in Nigeria, where we are with the kidnapping uh, for ransom. Uh, what uh, this uh, figure tried to show you is, you know, the extent of kidnapping. You can also see the history that uh, between 1984 and 2012, uh, kidnapping has really, really uh, skyrocketed. Um, in 1983, there were just about two kidnappings. Uh, in 1984, uh, that figure was almost about three, uh, but you can see that uh, after 2000, or especially following the adoption of uh, the constitution, uh, the new democracy, or the end of the military rule, uh, kidnappings uh, have really become a serious problem in Nigeria, reaching their peak in 2013. Uh, but uh, I think most will even say that uh, 2016 has also been very, very uh, problematic. Um, the if, if you look at this figure here, I'm trying to show you the trends in kidnappings in Nigeria, where you can see that uh, in 2013, there were about 3,608. Just to give you, uh, you know, some sort of a picture of, you know, the problem of kidnapping uh, in Nigeria, to see the growth uh, in the problem uh, throughout uh, the history of that country, particularly from 2007 to 2013. Um, then let's look at, you know, why Boko Haram kidnapped? Why was uh, this kidnapping on the 14th of April uh, 2014 uh, important? Why, was, why did Boko Haram undertake uh, that endeavor? And why, why was it important for the group, uh, by the way? Uh, now, if you look at the history of Boko, Boko Haram kidnappings, you'll see that, uh, you know, there are estimates uh, putting it at 10,000. This is a group that, when they started in 2002, um, they really were against, they rejected kidnappings as a practice, uh, you know, saying that it was a dirty job and so on. But by 2012, you know, the group uh, decided, you know, especially with the uh, um, splintering of uh, the so-called and Saru uh, decided to embark on the kidnapping, and 2013 is when they carried out their first major uh, kidnapping. Uh, but before 2014, before the April 14 uh, kidnapping of uh, the Chibok girls, um, that was not uh, really the first Boko Haram kidnapping. I think what was unique with that particular kidnapping was that it was the largest so far that we had seen uh, uh, kidnapped by Boko Haram. Uh, but, you know, the international community focuses a lot on these particular kidnappings and forget the other kidnappings that uh, have happened. For example, if you look at uh, the same kidnap the same month uh, or the same year, sorry, in 2014 when Boko Haram kidnapped uh, over 500 uh, women and children uh, in uh, northeastern Nigeria or the city of of uh, uh, Damasak, um, which again did not really, um, the, the international media did not really uh, report on this as they did for the uh, Chibok school girls. We'll come to look at the importance of that uh, Chibok kidnappings and why, you know, the international media was so uh, furious about it. The Chibok school girls uh, kidnapping, uh, just to give you an overview, uh, I think you will recall that 276 uh, girls were actually uh, kidnapped uh, just when the lorry was, the lorry that uh, were carrying the girls uh, was about to kick off, about 57 of them escaped. Uh, then later on, two years down the line, one of the girls was found in uh, Sambisa Forest, uh, you know, where they were actually kept. And then two uh, uh, also escaped from captivity. This was uh, actually last year. Um, and then through negotiations uh, in, uh, in October 2016, the government was able able to uh, liberate 21 girls uh, after brokering a deal with uh, Boko Haram. Uh, 
Uh, the other uh, key uh, kidnapping uh, or the other uh, release, uh, the main negotiation that they had was, of course, the, the most recent one that occurred on the uh, 6th of May uh, 2017, when about 82 uh, Chibok school girls were liberated after some lengthy negotiations. We'll come uh, to see a little bit about this negotiation as we move on. But what is important to note here is that there are about 113 girls that are still in captivity. Now, uh, why did Boko Haram kidnap the school girls? I think this is an important question for us uh, to know because it's also important to understand the, uh, uh, why you know, uh, the international media uh, became so obsessed. Uh, with this particular kidnapping. We are not saying that uh, this was bad, but we are saying that, you know, there have been numerous kidnappings uh, by Boko Haram, some of them even bigger than the Chibok school girls. Uh, but, you know, the focus on the Chibok school girls uh, have, to some extent, uh, created what some regard as a double standard. Uh, but Boko Haram, why they move into that uh, secondary school uh, in a small remote city in northeastern Nigeria was really re to, to, to express what is really deep in their uh, ideology, which is how they see women in their ideology, how they see women uh, in Islam. Uh, for, for Boko Haram, they believe that women should be at home. Women should not uh, be in school. They should be at home doing domestic work and taking care of their uh, husbands. Um, then the, the, the philosophy, that particular philosophy of Boko Haram, that women belong to the kitchen or women belong uh, to home, not in schools, uh, was what actually provoked them. But um, I think from further analysis, what we found was that, you know, there the was the aspect of revenge. Uh, Boko Haram thought that uh, the Nigerian military uh, has been kidnapping or uh, 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 arresting their wives and their children uh, and uh, you know they needed uh, to to revenge uh, this so the kidnapping uh, was f uh, partly for that uh, reason now um, I think if we are to analyze uh, why this became uh, so international uh, the, 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 the key here is that it was the social media uh, this was really a social media movement. And uh, we've seen how, you know, when something uh, is uh, tweeted or something, uh, there's a hashtag to something, uh, how it can go really global. Uh, you know, in Nigeria, the, the, the difference, the main difference between uh, the Chibok school girl kidnapping and other kidnappings in Nigeria is that, you know, um, for the other kidnappings, we didn't have the creation of a social media movement. We didn't have, you know, the so-called bring back our girls, you know, people who were dedicated, you know, to advocate for the freedom or the, uh, the liberation of these girls. And therefore, when, once that movement the, the, with the hashtag bring back our girls was created immediately after the kidnapping of uh, the Chibok school girls, uh, the issue went viral. Uh, and uh, people asked, raised so many questions that... Is it the first time that Boko Haram has kidnapped? Certainly no. And even to, to add to that, was that in January of the same year, Boko Haram had killed about 2,000 people uh, in Baga. Uh, and that issue was not as reported as, uh, you know, the Chibok school girls uh, kidnapping uh, went viral internationally. So therefore, many started asking questions what went wrong. But I think this famous uh, picture of uh, Michelle Obama speaks volumes in terms of the international involvement and how it attracted um, uh, you know, the prominent people in the world, and which is what, again, drives social media, what drives, you know, this kind of movement to go uh, to reach certain areas. Um, let's briefly just look at the, the negotiation, how it's a call. Um, we, we know very little about it, apart from what has been reported in the media. Most often these negotiations are kept very secret, uh, and therefore um, the uh, negotiators choose to release certain information. And what we know so far about uh, the negotiation that led to the release of the 82 girls um, is that it was brokered by the uh, uh, International uh, Red Cross 
the ICRC and the Swiss government, uh, which was behind the uh, ICRC. Uh, once, when the ICRC was interviewed, they, they really underplayed their role. They said their role was really to, to uh, bring the two sides together and to facilitate uh, the discussion. Um, they, what they said they did was actually to transport you know, the girls from Boko Haram to the Nigerian military and also to transport uh, um, the, um, uh, the militants that the Nigerian government released uh, to Boko Haram. So they played that middle role um, uh, in the negotiation. But what then were Boko Haram's uh, uh, demands? What did Boko Haram want from this negotiation? Uh, you know, this was not the first time that uh, a negotiation between the Nigerian government and Boko Haram is taking place. Um, previous attempts have failed miserably uh, because of lack of trust. So this time, you know, uh, for the negotiation to succeed, both sides were supposed to show uh, that they were committed and that they were serious. And what Boko Haram really asked, which is what they, they had asked right from the beginning when they kidnapped the Chibok school girls, was that they wanted an exchange. They wanted money. Uh, I think by 2017, uh, 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 um, Boko Haram uh, had really uh, been handicapped. They have lost a lot of uh, combatants. They've lost a lot of resources. And therefore, they saw the Chibok girls as an opportunity, as a leverage for them to gain back some of the strength that they need. Therefore, they asked for the release of their militants. They asked for huge sums of money, uh, most of which the government was not prepared to pay. So the, from the government side, what they asked for was really just the release of all, of all the girls. Now, let's uh, quickly uh, look at what the D uh, came up with. Uh, now, uh, Boko Haram was supposed to release uh, 83 girls, uh, but finally only 82 were, um, were released because one of them refused uh, to leave uh, uh, her husband, who is a Boko Haram uh, commander, which again raised the issue of the fact that some of the girls might not return because of their attachment to the group, to their kidnappers, um, which is uh, very, very controversial because many people think that it is a good thing to release these girls. Uh, meanwhile, to some of the girls, this is not uh, the best option that they want. Uh, we'll come to speak at some, uh, 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 to speak of some of the issues behind, you know, these girls when they are released and why some of these uh, might actually refuse, uh, you know, their liberation. Uh, what uh, came up for Boko Haram, what we know so far, which is still very disputed. These figures are very, very disputed. Particularly, the number of Boko Haram commanders were that were released. For example, I think the the common figure is that five. Five Boko Haram commanders were released, and uh, they were also paid a lot of money. Um, the sum that uh, finally was received by Boko Haram is not known, um, but some are estimating that's about $10 million. Uh, um, what are the implications of you know, this whole deal? Um, I think that there is uh, an international community uh, growing practice. You know, that does not favor negotiation with terrorist groups. Uh, but there is a moral dilemma here that, you know, um, uh, countries or government have to face. Uh, as you will recall, that, you know, this whole uh, uh, Chibok school girls deal has been something that uh, the Nigerian government has taken seriously. Not because, you know, there was something really unique to it. I think it's purely because of the international pressure on the government that, you know, people saw the blatant manner in which these girls were kidnapped. And therefore, the government thought, uh, you know, it, it, it has to liberate these girls. It has to show the international community that it was committed. It was, um, you know, a responsible government. And therefore, that's why, you know, uh, the, the government has uh, really attached a uh, lot of importance to uh, the release of this girl. The other implication is, of course, we've talked of the double standard. The fact that a lot of attention has been paid to these girls and not to other kidnappings. Uh, you know, uh, we can go into much details how what that could mean, but um, for the uh, lack of time, let me highlight the fact that for the campaign to, to defeat or to eliminate Boko Haram, this kind of deals are not good. This kind of deals, they tend to uh, re-energize the group, they tend to uh, give the group some sort of a legal image. Uh, this kind of deals, they tend to uh, refurnish the group with uh, what they want. For example, uh, we know that a uh, lot of Boko Haram commanders uh, have been killed and therefore now the, the release of these five has actually given them some strength. Um, the last point I want to highlight here is the fact that, you know, um, 
the 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 so called you know uh, um, um, uh, bring back our girls campaign. What did it really do? What are the implications? I see it to be both uh, positive and negative. Let's just uh, highlight the negative aspect of it. But because of the creation of this bring back our girls, I think these girls assume a new importance. I call them, they, they became golden girls for Boko Haram because Boko Haram all of a sudden discovered the value of these girls. And therefore, um, the girls were to act for leverage, they were to serve for leverage for the group for any potential negotiation with the government as we have seen. Because if the group had not attached this importance, it wouldn't have been able to uh, broker this deal with the government. But the other thing we could also highlight is that for the girls, this was good, you know, because now the girls, when Boko Haram kidnapped them and the international community accorded this high importance to the girls, Boko Haram had to treat them with care to make sure that they were uh, uh, safe, to make sure that uh, at least they were in good conditions, uh, you know, unlike they would treat other girls because they knew the future uh, that these girls will bring for, for the group. So that was extremely important and therefore this mixed message, you can uh, choose which side you want to go. And then uh, to really conclude um, is what is the next step? Where are we going? What is remaining in this whole uh, Chibo school girls drama? Um, I think what is at stake is that the government has committed to liberate the 113 girls who are left. We are not sure whether all of these girls will come, uh, but we know that the government remains committed. But the other thing also to ask when we talk about, you know, the release of all the girls is that are all the girls still alive? The 113, which we assume, are all of them alive? I think uh, even from Boko Haram reporting is that some of these girls have been killed. We saw uh, in the 82 that were released that one was, uh, uh, one had, uh, you know, was handicapped with a leg, uh, one had a broken arm, which means that, and Boko Haram had, initial, uh, had said that um, this was because of the bombings uh, uh, by the Nigerian uh, military. So we are not sure whether all of these girls are still there, are still intact. And even if all of them are still intact, we are not sure whether they will all accept to be liberated and to come back to their communities. The, the way forward now is that the government is carrying out huge rehabilitation and reintegration programs, uh, you know, to, for the girls really to be reintegrated into their families, because back there in Nigeria, particularly uh, in the northeastern Nigeria, there's a lot of stigma to uh, girls uh, who have been uh, really molested by groups such as Boko Haram. And therefore, we, the fear is that once these girls are reintegrated, this stigma might stay with them, and therefore it will, it will not give them a meaning for them to live. Um, what happened with the 20 one that were released last year is that some of them went abroad and this is the angle that I would really want to promote to say that probably it's good you know to take them out completely out of Nigeria um, so that they can see life from a different perspective and also uh, forget what they had gone through in Nigeria thank you very much